Creatives with AI Podcast, the spiritual home of creatives curious about AI and its role in their future. Christopher, welcome to the podcast. Ah, oh, my goodness. What a great fun. <laughs> what great fun to be here. Um, I am live and direct. It is 10 o'clock in the morning and we are in the city of Brighton. And the only things that are going to interrupt our conversations are either batteries for this phone <laughs> or, um, or or seagulls. Or seagulls. Walking, yeah, outside. Yeah. So you can just know that it, this is happening in reality. This is not a deep fake of any description. So we, we met at the Independent Podcast Awards, didn't we? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And um, we... Go ahead. No, I think it was, when was it? Was it, I can't remember. Was it October? Or... No, it was before that, I think. Was it? Oh, maybe it was October. Yes. Mm. Around that time. Yeah. And you, did you win something yourself or were you, knew some people that won something? <laughs> I produced a podcast that was uh, literally, uh, it was called Clown Sex. And um, it, annoyingly, for the uh, for the writer who played seventeen different characters in this podcast, um, they won the um, they won the prize for best artwork. So absolutely nothing to do with podcasting <laughs> whatsoever. And um, even though they were very happy to go on stage and receive the award, I'm sure they would have been much more, much more enjoyed. <laughs> much more enjoyed actually winning something for the audio or the content though it was brilliant and i do recommend clown sex it is a roller coaster ride of filth and um only you know <laughs> when to get off excellent okay love it and yeah it was it was a that was a, a really good night and i think that was the first that was the inaugural independent podcast awards as well wasn't it so it's the very first one I have to say, I, I'm just going to do a bit of flexing here. I've been to several several podcast awards, and I have to say it was the most fun of all of them. Um, so uh, in 2018, I created a uh, drama podcast called Rathband, which went on to win Best BBC Podcast 2018 for drama um it's never actually been on the bbc and they didn't have bbc sound so um it's just a strange award to win and then in 2021 in lockdown i created a drum and bass musical about eating disorders for teenagers and okay. that won a bronze and a silver at the british podcast awards for well-being and drama again so i'm part of that kind of indie podcasting drama scene where because you know the way i see theaters in the uk is they're just a little bit like volcanoes and mm. you know they're only about 200 of them and and you know it's a very strange and partly broken business model it's very expensive to make theater it's a bit like watercolor and would everybody's there like hoping it isn't going to just be like watercolor in relationship to the rest of art but you know fingers crossed it won't be no i hope not and so so how is ai fitting into all of this stuff the way i conceive of ai is that it it's like an alien intelligence that landed in the town square at some point in 2022 um, for, the, for, for most of us. And it's disguised itself as a funfair ride. And it's just there, like something wicked this way comes. And you look at it and you're like, wow, that looks so exciting. Look at all the rides. We could have so much fun and all the things that we could possibly do. And so in education, which has obviously pride itself on, you know, being at the forefront and teaching from, um, sorry, th there's now a drill. Of course there's a drill. I hope you can't hear it too much. I can't hear it. It's okay. Don't worry. Okay. It's all right. What I'm trying to get is I, I, I'm trying to get a sense of what you think about, you know, how is AI impacting? It could be writing. It can be education. It can be you know, what's going on in the arts. I mean, obviously this is a creatives, you know, we focus this show on creatives. Let me tell you something interesting. Obviously I was born in 1973 and, and you know, I was growing up as a teenager in the height of the cold war. So it's kind of, you know, uh, it's kind of, I'm steeped in it. Hmm. And one of the things I read uh, a couple of years ago was the fact that when the photocopier uh, was, you know, was just being released amongst, you know, American and British and, you know, Western European businesses, um, the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc looked at it with absolute terror because the possibility of the absolutely free copying of information meant that they absolutely lost control. And so, you know, it seems ludicrous now to think that you'd want to ban the photocopier. And I know that you know, sometimes analogies take you down the wrong route, but do you know what? Universities are deeply challenged by AI on every level for the reasons that you've just specified, as in, you know, they teach from, you know, the forefront of their research and they create, they ask people to kind of um, 
they ask people to read a lot and kind of blend all of that information and for people to find out what they understand and to build themselves. But obviously it's too tempting to just, you know, to see what GPT would say. And, and that's, I think one of the challenges is that um, AI can eat you for lunch. <laughs> that's one of the dangers that I see specifically, specifically from a creative perspective. Um, so, you know, the fact that it could write a script that's really funny potentially um very quickly indeed it's like well you know well, well then what's the point why should i even write if you know i can just you know get something else to do it for me and you know we suffer when we outsource things to pieces of technology the nature of the internet is absolutely magic and loss you get a bit of magic and you get a bit of loss magic and loss and i think um i can't remember the writer who it was we probably put it in the show notes but she wrote the book magic and loss and it's absolutely stayed with me because it's you know i've worked on the internet since 1999 and it's absolutely true we are, you know we are, we lose things and we gain things and so what i'm trying to do when i'm bringing in ai to my teaching so um maybe i'll just take a step back and tell you what i teach you know so let's just go through the week Great. yeah Monday, let's teach creative social media. Creative social media is just essentially trying to explain to people how to communicate within, within the attention economy. And wow, is this going to make the attention economy even more, uh, you know, a hurricane than it was before? We're not going to be able to know what's true. We're not going to be able to kind of make judgments, you know, and the whole of the history of the first 20 years of the internet is like, let's make this a trust, a place where people can trust each other. Cause otherwise, no, there's no such thing as e-commerce because, you know, nobody would put a credit card within a mile of the internet. Yep. So that level of trust is absolutely in peril. And I think that um, people are reducing the amount of, we used to trust technology quite a lot, but now we just think it's running way behind, you know, the legislators and we are, you know, we're removing our trust from technology very quickly. You hear that, you know, in the terms that people are talking about banning social media, TikTok's going to be get banned. I absolutely believe TikTok is going to get banned because, you know, America needs a scapegoat and that's a pretty one that it can kill without actually doing too much damage, really. Um, so going back to uh, AI and so Monday, creative social media, obviously, um, when we can't trust social media, what we're going to do is we're going to place our trust in places where people can see each other. We'll place trust in our workplaces. We'll place trust in our institutions. We'll place trust in podcasts because, you know what, interestingly, you know, podcasting is like intimacy at great scale. And so consequently, um, uh, you know, it, we trust what we hear with our ears more than we trust what we see with our eyes, I believe. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. All right, so that's Monday's done. And then um, on Thursdays, I teach creativity, uh, entrepreneurship and digital marketing. So what does that mean? It's just trying to create a, you know, a mindset of being able to bypass the gatekeepers that you either create in your mind or actually exist for young people. And so we kind of like, I want the students to leave with the ability to kind of put their hand in a bag and kind of come up with an idea when they need to come up with an idea. And that's a kind of, that's a kind of confidence and a belief that you can increase your creativity by doing it every single day and having a kind of practice. Um, the entrepreneurship is, you know, we get them to come up with business ideas and, you know, they have to follow that, that business for 22 weeks. They have to create a media plan and then they have to create content off the back of that. All of those things are being impacted by, by AI. Massively. Um, and I'll just carry on because uh, to some extent it also causes friction between the lecturers. Some of the more academic lecturers and the ones that focus on, um, the ones that kind of focus on theory, you know, they see these AI written essays and, you know, you know, if they mark them, they give them a 50, you know, because they're all right. And uh, generally speaking, you can spot this stuff that's written by AI because it's generally the students who have less confidence and, you know, they, you know, they don't replace the S's with Z's or no, the Z's with S's. Yeah, and, that's a big one. Yeah, it, it is. Um, so that's, that's that. So, and then on Fridays, mostly I teach screenwriting. And again, um, having done lots of experimentation with the way that kind of, obviously that's one of the sweet spots for AI at the moment is filmmaking people, you know, yeah. people were spending millions of pounds yeah. on the like virtual production walls, you know, and that's already gone. They've already yeah. moved on, you know? Yeah. And so it's now being replaced by, you know, creating worlds in unity and, and unreal and using AI to create virtual worlds. But what I'd like to do and what I'd really love to share with your listeners is just the framework for kind of going on an experiment with 
the people that they're teaching. I don't know if this is going to be helpful, but let me just let you tell you about a class that I did just yesterday. <clears throat> and so one of the things that I really adore about AI creativity is its ability to create multiverses. So what do I mean by multiverses? I mean that you can just take a family picture, you can upload it into Midjourney, ask it to describe what it sees, and it will create four versions of your family. And you can amend each of the prompts. So you can make a sci-fi version of your family. You can make a Southern Gothic version of your family. You can mess about with reality. And there's a certain, if you bring in stuff from real life and put it into AI, it has a certain quality that is much more interesting to me than stuff that actually just comes from the soup. And so we, we, we asked the students to kind of just play with, you know, ideas for that. Um, what did we do then? Then I did something quite interesting, which is I think it's really fun to kind of imbue like a tool like ChatGPT with a character. Yeah. Um, because um, I'd read a lot of those studies that says, you know, that, you know, the more polite you are to these tools, the better results you get back. And personally, I believe that that's because by being polite, it puts you into a frame of mind that's more reflective. And so the whole experience gets gets better. You know, it changes you. Um, I try and teach the students that, you know, whereas it can kind of eat them for lunch um, from a creative perspective, the absolute sweet spot, I believe, is them to find this kind of co-creation space. Um, you know, intelligence A, you, intelligence B, AI, you know, intelligence C. That's the place that doesn't eat your lunch. That's the place where really interesting things could happen. And so yesterday, and I will let you speak in a moment. No, no, I got it. <laughs> yesterday, I asked them to do some research using perplexity, which um, is obviously because yeah. it brings in the actual sources is, is a much more university friendly piece of technology. And so you can cite those references and go deeper should you want to. What a piece of genius that is. Um, so they had to create um, Dionysus. They had to find out all about Dionysus. And then what they had to do is that they had to then tell GPT uh, to become Dionysus. And so they were then in a conversation with a god. Okay. Now, my my point of view is, is this, is that as a, as a writer, I'm constantly trying to get the students to try and plug into the collective electricity that's running through society's mind. That's really, the, if you can just supply the words and the ideas and put them on a stage or on a screen, you are absolutely doing your job as a writer. You're helping society to uh, ultimately to ask that, that question, which every generation asks is like, how do we survive now? How do we live in this generation? You know, and that's, it's really interesting. The Greeks would always take their characters to the land of the dead and they would stand at the veil between the land of the living and they would say, how do we live? What do we do? You know, and everything that you see on a stage is the land of the dead. Everything that you see on a screen is the land of the dead. And everything that is in the world of the audience is the land of the living. And so I then asked them, asked them to ask Dionysus for directions to the veil between the land of the living and the dead. Right. And once they were there, they had to ask it questions about, you know, what was going through Britain's mind? What are the challenges that England's having? And, you know, how do we solve them, oh, people, oh, dead people? <laughs> and what... what... I don't even know where to go with that. What did it, what were some of the, did they get interesting responses? Um, yeah, obviously Brexit came up quite a lot, you know, immigration, yeah, I imagine. you know, all, all, all the, all the tried and tested, uh, you know, we, we know them all. Um, but uh, you can see what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to get, create this playful space, right? Where you don't just have to be asking, you know, the ghost in the machine. You can get the ghost to pretend to be whatever they, you know, whatever you want it to be, to be more helpful to you. Yeah. Um, and I think we really do lack the vocabulary to talk about some of the feelings that we're having when we're kind of interrogating AI. I feel that. You know, we need words like half alive, half conscious, because, you know, that, those feelings are uncanny of, you know, sometimes the replies are astounding. And I often ask the students to kind of just work out how do you, you know, what, what is it making them feel? Um, so obviously after Dionysus, what did we get them to do then? Um, we got them to put in their scripts that they've been working on. And that's a kind of like, that's like, wow, that's like, inter, you know, if, if AI is a fun fair ride, that's a pretty weird fun fair ride to put in your own work. <laughs> yeah. And so what we then did is we then asked them to um, uh, 
Before they put it in, they had to take one of the main characters, place them on their knees and, and write a prayer that they said at the end of their bed. Because if you can get a character's want, then you're a really deep way to kind of making a good piece of drama or film. And then, and then what they had to do is they had to put in their, their scene and ask, ask GPT to, to analyze the subtext. So what is the subtext? It's the, it's the unsaid word in every scene. It's the, it's, the, it's, it's the thing underneath that makes drama really, really interesting. It's the thing that actors emote brilliantly, that kind of like yeah. the inner conflict. Yeah. And wow, it blew their minds because it's so good. If you just ask it, what's the subtext of the scene? It's so good at picking that out. It's so good. And it's funny that you mentioned that because I've talked about before um, what I found it really useful for is doing something similar, which is a top tip for anybody listening. Um, I find it really useful when I'm running grant proposals or tender responses, particularly to public sector, because you're very, very limited on the number of words you can use usually. Mm -hmm. Like the, the new style that they've been doing lately for the past couple of years is you have 400 words only to answer a question about what's this project going to do? What's mm -hmm. the project going to be? Who's like, what's the project plan? And it's like, you're supposed to attach a spreadsheet to it, but you only get 400 words to summarize it. And what I found using GPTs for is we would write something and then put it in, but exactly as you said, I'm like, what's the message? And ask it, what's the message? And it's the same thing, right? So it's what, mm. what is, forget all the individual words, but what are we, what are we saying here? And we would, we would then make sure that the message that we were, the, the subtext to it was addressing the need that we knew that they had because a lot of times it's not clear you know they'll, the government will put out a bid and it'll say look we're going to give you know four million pounds to to 10 different mm. councils to do this 5g mm. thing and blah 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 and it's like right okay well that seems pretty clear on the surface but actually what are their motivations why are they giving this money what are they motivated to do and what do we need to do to tick their internal boxes? So we made an assumption of, well, we think that it's an election year. They've got extra budget left over. They're looking for good PR. They need a good story to run into the election, <laughs> you know, looking at the dates and blah, blah, blah. So what we had to do was, was we wanted to make sure that, hey, the program, I mean, we're going to deliver the program and the program is good. Mm -hmm. But we also had to make sure that the kind of subtext of that story was, that we would be able to support those efforts with good PR and with case studies and with a demonstration of how that money was used for good value for the people and that sort of thing. And you're absolutely right. It's genius at doing that kind of thing. It really is. It's, I don't know how it does it, you know. Um, when I'm trying to teach um, about, about like just the foundational ideas about what AI is and how it understands words, um, the analogy I, that I use is, you know, when you look up at the night sky and see all the stars and you've got absolutely no idea what's happening on those stars and also the lights from, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, you know, years ago. But our ancient ancestors would be able to look up at the stars and know where they were. In the same way, a computer does not understand the semantic meaning necessarily of those words. It just knows the combinations. And from those combinations, it can tell you what you need to know. It's a kind of navigation tool. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I try and find metaphors because I'm quite, you know, theatrical metaphors and similes that try and kind of get some of these ideas across in a kind of more naturalistic way. Um, I also think it's like, you you see so much this we're still at a big in this in the hype cycle you know it's coming down a little but it's still wild and and ultimately people don't uh you know are, are worried about what's going to happen to education but you know we forget that 300 years ago we'd send people around the world to navigate it and they probably only knew six books <laughs> You know, they were, you know, yeah, they, were the, they were the Greek and Aristotle, you know, they were Plato, they were all of those texts. But, you know, it is possible to navigate the world with 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 wisdom as opposed to necessarily knowledge. Um, so. Where's the wisdom come from? 
<laughs> I mean, Pain, I haven't seen painful much, experience. Yeah, I haven't seen much wisdom lately. I have to say. <laughs> um, the other so subtext is different, and then obviously, the, I'm a real fan of the work of um, uh, uh, Ethan Molik on LinkedIn, who's at the Wharton Business School. I'm a real fan. There's a guy called Ben Barakas. I'll get that completely wrong. We'll put it in the show notes. Um, who is a history teacher at the University of Chicago, and he led really early on with something that's absolutely joyous. He created prompts to create choose your own adventures. So as uh, so I'm teaching writing, one of the pivot points is obviously we now the, we now the video games generation where they used to kind of like yeah. being they're used to being the first person in the story and having an identity imbued on them and they understand what they're doing and they can play in that in that way. And so this history teacher would create a prompt for a 10 um, 10 go game, choose your own adventure game where they had to navigate across Paris in 1348 during a plague and they had to survive. Um, okay. And so I sometimes take those that prompt and I work with other teachers to uh, kind of, you know, update it for whatever they're doing. I did one for entrepreneurship, for example. You know, you're a, t- you're a startup. You've got to survive one year. How are you going to do it? And obviously the, the... Can you tell me as well? <laughs> <laughs> execute, execute, execute. <laughs> um, uh, and I hope you're at the right time. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a whole nother story. We could, we could talk about that totally separately, but I had another company and it was just, we, we were at exactly the wrong time and, um, it was a great idea, but it was exactly the wrong time. And, um, yeah, that was, that was annoying. Anyway, sorry, I digress. So th- I hope I've given an example of how I just cry- try to create the co-creation space that doesn't eat you for lunch. And also along the time, I also ask people ethical questions. So, okay, you want, you use this technology, you've just put 36,000 actors in London out of work. Is that something you want to do? Is that, you know, is that your, is that your, you know, that's the probable future, but is it your preferable future? Yeah. Okay. Go on. Sorry. No. Oh, and yeah. So uh, it's, it's kind of like an ethical, you know, each of the rides in my kind of mythical AI fun fair has ethical costs. And people often, you know, you see these headlines, you know, oh, there will be 17 billion connected devices in by 2030 or this and that. And I mean, the simple reality is we don't have the energy for that. <laughs> Most of that probably isn't going to happen because then we are constrained by certain things and energy is, is going to be one of them. Yeah. It's, we will. And I had a really interesting chat with the, the, the podcast actually that went out today was um, from a guy I know in Silicon Valley. His name's Chase and he runs this company that does, anyway, they, they can rate how reliable news articles are. But what I found really interesting in talking to him is because he lives in Silicon Valley, he has a slightly different perspective on it and he's fully drinking the Kool-Aid. And, you know, his position was, and I, I was slightly cheeky in that I was trying to draw it out of him a little bit. And I think I was, was successful, which the idea is, is that, yeah, but it doesn't matter. Like, you know, technology will solve everything and it doesn't matter if people are put out of work now because later technology will figure out how to do something. And yeah, there might be a few people that are inconvenienced in the short term. And I'm like going, yeah, okay. <laughs> like... It's just, you know, it was that glossing over of it. And, and yeah. I've, like, I've worked in tech for nearly 35 years and I've worked for startups and I understand the mentality of it. But this is a whole different kettle of fish, I think. And, you know, nothing has come for, I, I've said this a load of times and, and people have called me up on it, but nothing's come for the smart people before, right? Like, it, it's always been a physical thing. It's always been a, a re, you know, an industrial revolution. It's been machines. Mm. and that sort of thing but no one's you know all those people that did those jobs went into the marketing and advertising and ad tech and all these other you know kind of startup businesses and all the digital companies and that's where the jobs have migrated over time there is a whole lost generation of people who had those skills who don't have digital skills who were out of work and that was it like absolutely they they had no job and Mm -hmm. no one likes to talk about that and I fear that we're going to get to that same place moving forward. <laughs> like thinking of um, screenplays. I was at an event about, must have been about a year ago. And 
even then they were talking about, you know, it used to take, if somebody wanted to, to take a book and they bought the rights to a book and they wanted to write a screenplay for it, it would take months mm -hmm. to sit in, and then take that book and digest it and turn it into a screenplay of something that was decent. They're like, we can put it into to chat GPT and say, write a screenplay and it will do 80% of the work for us. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. like, we, it then becomes an editing job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can then go back and put in the bits that we want, but the heavy lifting is done in like half an hour. And they're like, I, it's just the, the sheer scale of it. Now, there's still two, three, four, six months worth of going back and maybe editing that and whatever, but it it changes the it changes the, the field, doesn't it? Because now people mm -hmm. who who aren't screenwriters who maybe never had that experience or that skill can just go and chuck a book in and go, well, if I wanted to write a screenplay about this, this is a good place to start. Um, I, I love, I, yeah, I hear what you're saying. And, and it makes me think that we're in an age of what I would call contactless capitalism, you know, where if you can just remove as much friction between you and whatever thing you're doing, then yeah. that's a great thing. Um, you know, you tap on the, when you go to the shop, you know, you go to your self-service till and, you know, contactless. You then tap with your card, contactless. It's even called contactless. Yeah, no. But what I think yeah. is that, you know, we're going to be having scripts and you're just going to write the word contactless as in like there is something absolutely missing. And I think it's the, what, what's missing is friction. The, the friction of struggle, the friction of kind of, you know, just trying to wrestle with something with an eight legged octopus to kind of get it. And so two things you also remind me of. One, you know, you talked about grant applications. Um, I was speaking to somebody at the Arts Council recently and they said that the volume of arts applications has gone up since GPT, obviously. Yep. And they're really good applications and loads of loads of courses are also yeah, as your final bit of marking you're going to do an arts council application and it gets to the point where it's like the things that they choose it's just luck it's right. absolutely yeah. got to the point yeah. where it's like they've got so many that it's just almost becoming impossible to make those kind of decisions didn't uh, haven't publishers experienced the same thing like book publishers and that sort of thing it's like they've had a massive influx of you know obviously ai written content and just you know, the, I, I can't remember the stat. I did read it somewhere. I'll try and find it for the, for the show notes. And, and I apologize. I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it was like an 800% increase in the number of book submissions that they'd had before <laughs> generative AI came out. It's something ridiculous. <laughs> and, and essentially they're like, we can't even, we can't even sort through it to find the real stuff because it's, it's now just clouded everything that we're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I'm trying to get something published at the moment and it's, it, it should be a struggle because, you know, you want to read good things that have kind of gone through that, that session of, of that friction to try and make themselves as good as they possibly can be. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But um, again, I wonder what, you know, if, if there's, it, if there's too much information, we become very, very picky about how we allocate our attention. You know, people started talking about the attention economy back in the seventies, you know, we yeah. had attention is a finite resource and we only have so much of it. And so, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. I was, I was at an event yesterday put on by the economist and somebody said something really interesting in one of the presentations that I didn't know. And I found really interesting, and I, I think it's relevant to kind of to what we're talking about. They said that that companies who, see, if you had a manufacturing company like an automotive company, for example, and they went, oh, we've got all these you know robotics that we can put in, and it makes the company much more efficient, and it saves us money, and all of that. And they're like, fine, it does that. But what they found is from doing that, they lost the creativity in the company. Because the creativity was coming from the people working on the on the manufacturing line who had ideas about how to do stuff better, whereas the robots just do the task. And oh so my goodness. if the robot is efficient at doing the task, then there's no thought about, you know, the robots don't understand how the other robots deal with each other. And so they just do the task. And it's perfect in theory, from an economic standpoint, it's perfect. But from a business 
in a business strategic and a growth perspective, it's not as good because you don't have those ideas and you don't have that innovation bubbling to the surface from the people going, this is terrible. We need to fix this. And, or, you know, this part doesn't fit exactly right every time and it's really difficult or whatever it is. And I wonder if we're going to see the same thing in the creative industries. I mean, creative people are creative, right? Like that's never going to stop, but I just wonder if, if we're going to see the same sort of thing, whereas with, when AI starts to be used more and more, even as a tool that without that struggle that you're talking about and without sort of, you know, putting that effort out, are we going to lose some of the real creativity or maybe the people on the side who maybe before didn't realize that they were creative and they only kind of worked it out through struggling. Mm. If they don't have to struggle, maybe they'll never get there. I think so many things pop in my head. That's such a brilliant insight, I think. So, I mean, I don't know if you ever do your, do ironing. I, you know, Sunday night I'll put on Lord of the Rings and do some ironing. Um, but I think when you do something boring or repetitive or on a shop floor or in a factory, your brain goes into a kind of default mode. And in that default mode, very interesting things are happening. You know, it's, you know, you're, you're modeling versions of yourself. You're having autobiographical thinking and you're kind of just, your brain is just doing it in the background and it just pops up with a, with a, with an idea that it's never had before. And obviously social media has really challenged that for people because, you know, people are never bored or they don't have to be bored if they don't want to be bored, you know? And so there's that removal of that biographical thinking about what we want to do, who we're going to be and how, you know, what, you know, what have we got to offer the world? And so I think, yeah, that's an interesting space to, to keep looking at, to see what the results will be. But certainly I think you're describing a kind of thinning out of the quality, you know, and I think that it comes in the world of jobs. Again, I understand that like the lots of, you know, tools are now there to kind of gen- generate hundreds of letters to various companies and people turn up to interview and they've got no idea what it's all about. Yeah. And it's, yeah. I don't know. I think on the flip side of what you're saying, I ride a motorcycle. So I have downtime, mental downtime sort of, because when you're on a bike and you know, you're flying down the motorway at 70 or whatever, or you're on an A road, like you can't think about anything else. You literally have to be zoned into what you're doing. Cause it's, mm. it's not like being in a car where you can kind of put some music on and you can kind of zone out a little bit, because even if something goes wrong, you're probably, you know, you're, you're pretty safe. Like if I screw up on the bike, I'm dead. And, and so it focuses your attention. So it's almost, I, I, I compare it to meditating almost, but it's exactly what you're talking about though. It gives my brain time to work on stuff in the background. Mm. Right. And thoughts do kind of come out from that. But a lot of times their thoughts and, and this is where I see the positive side. I mean, social media has a lot of problems and, but one of the positives is people say, some people say some really interesting stuff. Mm. And I think I've seen things across, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or LinkedIn or like what, I don't really use Facebook, but a lot of the other platforms are on YouTube. Some people say some really insightful stuff and it's some of it really has given me the opportunity to reflect on myself in a different way, just by thinking about what, you know, other people have said. And yeah, there's, you know, 98% of the content out there is total rubbish. I think, and you know, people trying to be funny or they're trying to generate clicks or, or, you know, get money or whatever, Mm. but every once in a while you get a little nugget of something that's actually really insightful. And, and I think, (laughs) That's the magic of it. And maybe that's why people keep doing it because every once in a while you get just enough to keep you going. <laughs> I don't know. No, no, let me, I mean, I, I can talk to that. That's so interesting. Um, I think that the algorithms used to reward real people talking to real people. Whenever it saw that moment, you know, whenever it saw it, it was absolutely Ah, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna up that because social media is the biggest party and it's a party that must never end. And as soon as the party is over, the people are gone. Um, but when TikTok came along and it was so successful at hijacking your attention and was so entertaining and all the formats of transformation that came out, then the algorithms began to change. It's like, okay, so which of our users generating content has created a format? that works that's either funny useful beautiful or inspirational and does it all within the first six seconds and then takes people on a little transformational journey and it just rewards that now 
And so it's it has become, it's again, there's a thinning out, there's a loss there, you know, uh, we will have to find, and, and so what, what, what you were saying, which is very interesting, is the fact that when you do see one of those moments of humanity, that kind of nugget, that real person talking to a real person, you know, it means something. Do you think that's, do you think that's changing? Because I know on YouTube, it's definitely changing. And they're, you know, they, for the past few years, all the biggest accounts did this thing called retention editing, which is a quite internal industry term that probably no one will know what it means. But the whole idea is exactly what you said. It's get their attention as quickly as possible. Use lots of edits, use text, use, mm. you know, very flash, you know, quick edits across the thing to, mm. to maximize people's attention and get them stuck into the content. But it's also quite tiring when you look at it and you watch it for any length of time as well, because it, it, it's kind of fatiguing to your brain because there's so much going on. Yeah. But what's happened over the past 12 to 18 months is YouTubers and stuff like that. I mean, I, I, I have a YouTube channel that I do some stuff on. And so I, you know, I kind of watch other YouTubers and, you know, it's all very navel gazing mm -hmm. kind of stuff going on. But what's been interesting is, is that the algorithm has started to promote it's surfacing different content. The The algorithm doesn't push out content to anyone. It actually pulls content that people are, that thinks people will be interested in. Mm -hmm. And, and there's been a change into this more authentic, you know, it's, they call it anti-editing at this point. So it's, you know, it's conversations like this. It's just people having a real conversation. It's not overly edited. You know, you might just have a, a one second intro or a two second intro and then, and then it's just get straight into it. And it's people talking to people. Oh goodness, it's gone full circle. But it has, maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe YouTube is is leading the way on that because I think the other yeah. ones have, are, are still still stuck in TikTok in in that kind of you know funny, useful, beautiful, inspirational. And the, the data's yeah. in. That's it's it's a lot of big brands have trouble with um, with kind of this kind of entertainment thinking. They're very much stuck in like you know we are a big brand. We've got to be very trustworthy. We've got to stick to the message. We're going to just put loads of adverts out that kind of foster that message. And you know. Whereas all the platforms that they think they need to, where the attention is, are, you know, funny, useful, they're entertainment yeah. thinking. And so yeah. how do you get a brand to just to get on board with entertainment thinking? It might not suit their brand. It might not be right for their brand. Exactly. Um, and I, do you think, so here's the question, since you teach this sort of thing, do you think that that's because, because you and I are basically the same age, I'm a little bit older than you, but we grew up in a time where whenever we saw content, it was broadcast quality, professional, you know, professionals delivering very well spoken yeah. ads were, were, you know, professionally done all the time. There yeah. was no amateur content. It was all very professionally, very yeah. highly edited, very well done. And, and so the people of our age who have been in those marketing roles and the PR roles and all that, the advertising roles and those sorts of things, that's the content we grew up seeing. So we, we don't take the amateur content as seriously as we do the the high production value content mm -hmm. whereas society's changed and i think maybe that's what we're now seeing is we're seeing younger people coming into the profession and you know more and more of those people coming on and they grew up with mobile phones and seeing much more you know amateur content where now anybody can record anything i mean i have mm. a 600 pound camera with a 200 pound lens on it and i can record something that you know 10 years ago you would have needed a, a broadcast quality camera to get the quality mm. that you can get out of a of a small dslr now yeah do you think that's um, what do you think maybe that's what's feeding that is that it's just that it's generations I, moving through and, and moving out the other end. I do. I agree with you. But also I would add technology. So I think it's to do with the size of the screen. If you, you know, big stories for big screens, little stories for little screens. And if you, you know, go to a cinema and they will take you through some darkened corridors on purpose to get you to shed the outside world. And then you sit and you hear music and, you know, there's a kind of huge scale and kind of a sublimeness. And June was really good at this, you know, creating this idea of the sublime recently. Yeah. Yeah. We like that. Um, and, and so I think that if you're 
grown up in generation looking at stories on a small screen you don't necessarily have the skills to make stories for the big screen but we grew up with bigger screens and so yeah i think it's a mixture of exactly what you said as well as to do with some of the affordances of the technology so where do we go from here well that's a great question um that is a really really great question. i can only answer from where, where do i go from here i think i i think as an educator I, my job is to try and make sure that the students that go through the university are paying really, really good money for it, that they get the skills that they need to navigate the 21st century. What are those skills? And I think that there are actually like, you can list them, you know, there's like, you know, information management skills, communication skills, collaboration skills, you know, um, ethical skills, you know, stuff to do with just cultural awareness. And so it's a blend of hard skills and soft skills that we try and put together um, in order to kind of make citizens that can cope, cope with it and, and that uh, have you know, enough ethical awareness to realize that they want to, you know, they don't want to add to the noise. <laughs> they want to kind of, you know, they want to turn information into knowledge. That's the students I kind of want to put into the world that they can kind of simplify things. So yeah, where do we go in the future? We try and simplify as much as we possibly can, <laughs> if we can. But what about for you? It's a good question. Um, I. I'm a half, I'm a glass half full kind of guy about most things. And I really try and be positive about most of it. And I do think, I just think we're in a massive adjustment period and we've had to adjust to new tools always in the past. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is just another tool, although it's not just any other tool. It, it has a, I, what I'm worried about are the, the unintended consequences that we can't even see. And we have no way of predicting, you know, if we look back at, I, we all use social media as the mo the most recent example. And mm -hmm. could, could we, when social media have come out in the very beginning, could we have sat in a room and come up with, you know, and said, well, actually here are some of the problems that we think are going to come from this in society. Could we have done that exercise in the beginning? I don't know. I, I don't, you know, we have 2020 hindsight. And of course, when we see the problems, we go, well, yeah, you should have been able to see that in the beginning, but you can't. And it, that, that's not how it works. And yeah. I, I worry about, you know, what, what are the, what are those unknown consequences that, that we just, <laughs> we, we can't even work out, you know, are we going to end up at a, at a point where, you know, literally 30, 40% of the jobs are going to be gone? I don't know. But, but then you factor that in with other stuff, like, for example, you know, there's, there's been so many stories about, you know, young adults and children not wanting to have kids and the population numbers are actually falling and that's such a problem. Well, actually, if you lose 40% of the jobs, but you lose 40% of the population, then actually you're at a kind of a net zero again. That's so true. So there's other factors, like we haven't factored in a massive war. Like what happens when we have World War Three? There's tensions all over the world right now that are getting worse and worse. And, you know, you and I grew up during a, a period where there was a Cold War and, you know, we were nervous and, and, you know, kids have never experienced that, although they might start. And, you know, if, if something massive happens, then that changes all the geopolitical stuff. And... Mm you know, AI is going to be used in, in combat. I mean, I've, I've had a podcast a, a year ago talking about how that might happen. And it, it's, it, it's going to have impacts across. And I don't think, I don't think AI is going to destroy the world. People will destroy the world because of <laughs> the, the side effects or the knock on effects of what AI does, right? It's always people. It's true. I, I just, I just, yeah, I think you're right. Um, Oh, I forgot what I was going to say. That's, that's quite a glass. I ended up glass half empty there. I think <laughs> <laughs> you did. You did end up but that's glass. what I'm concerned yeah. about. That that that's my concern. But I do think that, you know, even now, I think people are using AI in a lot of instances, and we're figuring out how to use it right. This this is what you make me think about. The person who did do some of this thinking was Marshall McLuhan, and he's got this thing called the Media Tetrad. And it's his way of defining a truly advanced uh, kind of 
step change in technology. And I do recommend for you and the listeners to kind of just Google it on YouTube. Or, I'll, you know, I'll put a link in, don't worry. And so it essentially says a new piece of technology will have very, will have about four discernible effects. It will bring back a behavior from the past, interestingly. It will make a present behavior redundant. It will also, and this is the interesting one, it will have negative consequences, negative, they're called negative flip out consequences, which are a result of the success that cannot be, uh, cannot be, you know, they can't be predicted. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're looking, I mean, we're looking at the negative flip out consequences of the great success that AI is going to be, which is, you know, it doesn't feel, you know, it already is. It's, it's, it's amazing. So I think it's, I don't know if there's any way of predicting, but conversations like we're having here, we are co-creating intelligence between you and me and the listener and together, you know, we can, we can work these things out. And, and, you know, I, I, there are moments in history where you think the worst is going to happen, but it doesn't. There was 1926, you know, the great, you know, there was a general strike in the United Kingdom and, you know, Churchill kind of rallied as a conservative, was rallying the middle classes and they ended up doing all the working class people's jobs. They they delivered coal, they drove the buses and this moment of class war actually resulted in class reconciliation because, you know, the different classes suddenly understood each other in a way that they hadn't before. So, you know, that's my kind of trying to put some water back in the glass that we emptied earlier on. <laughs> no, that's it. That's interesting. And I think, I think on the creative side of it for, and I can speak for me personally as an example, and I've mentioned this before, it's, I was never, when I was younger and a kid, I was never encouraged really to do anything creative. I was never you know, I was never encouraged to do music or anything. So I was, I was one of those people who kind of bumbled through life just thinking I wasn't creative because I was never encouraged, I think, is part of it. Mm. But when, when we got to the point where I had some tools, some AI tools that could help me do like the podcast, for example, then I was like, okay, it gave me enough confidence to be able to try something new that I'd never done before that's on a, on a more creative vein than my technical stuff that I'd always done, right? Mm -hmm. And what's been the, the, the impact on me personally around self-confidence and everything else, like I never expected that to come from just having conversations with people on a podcast, but my self-confidence has, has increased massively and I'm much happier and I'm much more comfortable with that side of myself now just from but that's all as a result of have just having some simple AI tools that meant that it just gave me that little bit of confidence to do something that I'd never done and I wonder if we're going to see there, there must be other people out there like that as well and I yeah. wonder if we're going to see a big push and like even people who are like they they feel like they'd like to do like art maybe drawing or mm. photography, but they're like, I don't have the money or I don't have the skill. They're always making it some excuse. Mm. I don't have the skills. I'm not confident enough to do it because mm. I don't think it'll be very good, but they can start playing around with an AI tool and they have ideas about what sort of art they might want to make and they can start writing prompts and then the AI does it for them. I think you're, you're and absolutely it right. allows them to tap into some creativity and some part of their person that they've never been able to tap into before. And maybe that's, the one of the big positives that can come from it i'm such a fan of somebody called robert twigger he's a great british eccentric writer if you can get him on the show wow but he wrote us <laughs> okay uh, he wrote a book called uh, micro skills which is essentially you know he was saying that 90 percent of people will never be specialists we're generalists that's who we really are no ten thousand hours thank you very much yeah you know much more fun to have lots of little tiny skills like well, can you make the best omelet in the world can you do a barrel roll in a in a canoe you know those kind of things and so i do think that ai does allow you to kind of leapfrog to that point where you think, oh, I can do this. And you're right. That's a very big insight. It's a really, really cool insight. Um, I just wanted to say that my 11 o'clock meeting has just reminded me itself that it exists. No, perfect. Uh, I was uh, I was about to say we were running short on time anyway. So that's perfectly fine. Thank you very much. We'll leave it there for now. Um, I'd 
we sh- we should have a we should have a beer someday and have a chat because I reckon we could just keep going for another couple of hours if we wanted to. I've, but um, I've I've loved every minute of this, and thank you for going to all the effort of creating a podcast. Um, and uh, people feel free to get in contact with me. You know, um, I'm a, a gun for hire, weddings, bar mitzvahs, you know, <laughs> uh, a- AA meetings, AI meetings, <laughs> <laughs> AI meetings. Well, we're having an event later in the year. Um, Okay. You heard it here first, but um, okay. one of the Wonderful. one of the groups I'm in is is having a big event, three day event in October, so yeah, we may uh, we may tap you up for that as well. But I'm conscious you've got eleven o'clock. I will let you go. Um, thank you very much again for your time, and it was wonderful chatting to you. I've just had a ball. Thank you so much. Cheers. Goodbye. Creatives with AI is a proud member of the AI Podcast Network. To stay up to date with current episodes and show information, subscribe to their newsletter at podcastnetwork.ai. And don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast platform so you'll always get the episodes as soon as they're available. Thanks again for listening and stay curious.